Hi everyone. In this lesson, what we're going to do is we're going to make it so our dynamic list that we developed last class is able to store any type of data. Currently we have it sort of like hard coded so that it can only store string objects in the list. But the real array list in Java, as you know, can store any type of thing. It can be an array list of strings or an array list of doubles or an array list of person objects or an array list of any other class you can imagine. Now, we're going to have to learn how to use generics to do this. Generics is Java's way of allowing for you to have a type variable where you can say, we don't know what type this is yet, but it's gonna be filled in later. We'll use this not just for our dynamic list that we're talking about now, but for almost all the other data structures we're gonna do. When we look at binary search trees and hash tables and graphs, we also want those things to be able to store any type of data. So we're gonna learn this today and then kind of apply it throughout the rest of the semester. So let's take a look at how Java generics work. All right, so like I said, our goal today is to learn how to make a class generic so that it can be used to store any type of data. This is called parameterizing it across a class so that you can say not only does your methods have parameters, but actually your whole class has parameters. So we can say it's not just an array list, but it's an array list of string or an array list of integer. So if we wanna do this, we'll change our dynamic list class so that when you declare one, you would do it like this, dynamic list, and then in these angle brackets, you fill in the type. I'm sure you've all seen this with array list and other classes perhaps in Java. Doing that also changes the way that the methods work sometimes. So for instance, if you make a dynamic list of string and also a dynamic list of double like this, then that changes the way that the add methods work. The add method for the dynamic list made of strings takes a string argument, whereas the dynamic list made of doubles takes a double argument. So this is what we're gonna learn how to do, how to make this happen for our own classes that we're writing. It's actually pretty easy to do this in Java. What we're going to do is after the name of the class, we're going to include this little bit of code. In angled brackets, we're going to put in what's called a type parameter. This makes it so that inside of the class body, we can use this thing, whatever we called it, in this case, I called it type, as a stand-in for a type that's going to be supplied later. So if this thing class is going to be storing integers, this will be substituted later with integer. But if it's going to be storing strings, it'll be substituted with strings. Then throughout the body of the class, anytime we use that word that matches this one, it's going to be replaced by the type that is actually included. So this is basically the simplest example I could come up with for a generic class like this. We have this class called thing that just stores one thing, one type of object, no matter what you want it to be. And you fill in the type you want it to store with this type variable here. And so now you can see we made a private object of that type. The constructor takes in a parameter of that type, which we then assign into our object. The get method returns something of that type, and the set method takes one as a parameter and also stores it into the object. So wherever you would use a normal type, like int or string or scanner or whatever inside of code, you can substitute this type parameter instead, whether it's a declaration, a parameter type like this, or a return type. So it's actually not too complicated to do. Then when you go ahead and actually make an object of this class, in this case, thing, what you're going to do is you're going to fill in in angled brackets whatever object class you want it to be storing. I'm sure this looks super familiar from using array lists. In this case, we make an integer of thing called number and an integer of or rather a thing of string called message. Notice that you have to put these on both sides of the equal sign. So if we are declaring a variable and also instantiating it as well, you have to put the type on both sides. Just like array lists, you probably all know this already, but this thing inside of here has to be a class type. You can't use plain old int integer or plain lowercase f-l-o-a-t for a float or anything like that. It has to be a capitalized class type in Java. To get around that kind of restriction, Java has these things called wrapper classes, like integer here. And that basically just 
is a class version of an int so that you can use it in these generic classes like this. They also have ones for other ones like character and double and so on. So let's look at the example program that uses this thing object. Here we have the same code that I just showed you of this very simple generic class type here called thing that takes the one type parameter and basically just makes a little wrapper object for storing that thing and letting you get it back out again. Then we make, just as in the code I showed you, in thing integer called number and a thing string called message. You might think this is stupid because why wouldn't you just make a regular old integer and a regular old string? And you're totally right. This is just to show you sort of the mechanics of how the generic types are working. So then after we fill in that type, we have these two thing objects, number and message, but the thing that they're storing inside of them is different. Number is storing seven, whereas message is storing the string hello. So you can see that even though we have this one constructor here, we are able to pass in two different types of data. Here we're able to pass in the seven because the thing object is parameterized with integer. And here we're able to pass in the message hello because it's parameterized with string. Likewise, this get is returning something different for us, a different type of data. Here when we call number.get, it's returning to us an integer because we called it on an integer thing. Whereas here, when we call message.get, it's gonna return us a string because we call it on a string type thing. So let's go ahead and compile this code and see what happens. If we do java c generic.java and then just run generic, it gives us hello seven times because that's what this was programmed to do. It has a little loop that goes through seven times and prints hello each time. So again, this is just sort of a silly example, but it shows you the mechanics of placing the type parameter inside of these angled brackets. By the way, type here is not like a keyword or a reserved word in Java. We can call this whatever we want to, as long as we're consistent, like we can call this, I don't know, narwhal or something. And then it doesn't matter so long as everywhere else we call it narwhal as well. So this will work exactly the same. This is just a variable name. You can call it whatever you want. I usually like to call it just type because I feel like that is clear to me how it works and what it's doing. Some people use the more terse just T and call these all T something rather like this. And that works as well. It doesn't matter at all. It's just like your regular variables. You can call it whatever the heck you want so long as that you're consistent. Okay, so now let's move on and talk about the next topic regarding this, which is using multiple type parameters. This isn't a thing that we need for dynamic list, but it is going to be something we need later on. So I thought we would talk about it now while we're talking about generics and how this works. And that is when you have a class that has two different type parameters, you can go ahead and fill in those two different types using generics like this. The most common data structure or uh, rather class that comes with Java that has two type parameters like this is the hash table. Hash table is maybe something that you've used before. Maybe it's not, I'm not really sure. We're gonna cover building hash tables in this class in some detail. But for now, you just need to know that a hash table is a data structure that lets you map from one type of thing to another type of thing. It's like the dictionary in Python if you've used that. So the classic sort of first example of a hash table is making a phone book where you map people's names onto their phone numbers. And so you can put into the phone book these like pairs of things. Here is a name and here is the phone number associated with it. Then you can go ahead and call upon the hash table to say, what is Alfie's phone number or what is Bernard's phone number? And it gives you that back out. So it basically makes a mapping from one kind of thing onto another kind of thing. But it doesn't have to be names onto numbers. It could be names onto addresses. So you put in a string and it associates it with another string. Or it could be integers to strings or integers to student records or any kind of thing. It just maps from one kind of thing onto another kind of thing. And so the way that that's done is with two different type parameters like this. 
Now in Java, there's actually no limit to how many type parameters you have. You can have 10 different type parameters for a class. I don't think I've ever seen that before. That would be kind of weird to do. So one is really common, two is happens sometimes, and beyond that, it doesn't really happen much. But in theory, there's no limit. So let's look at how we would deal with two type parameters like this. It's actually pretty simple. You would just include two different things in your class declaration line like this. Now I've called them type one and type two. Again, these are just variable names. You can call them whatever the heck you want to call them. Type one and type two kind of makes sense to me. So this class is called pair and it stores two things inside of it, whatever you want them to be. So it has one thing of type one and one thing of type two, which I've called first and second. This has a constructor that takes the two things you want to store and stores them. Then it has a method to get the first thing, which is a type one object, and the second thing, which is a type two object. This is only slightly more useful than the last example, the thing example, but it does let you do one thing that is maybe kind of helpful sometimes, which is to write a method that returns two different objects at once. So here's the code to do that. We have our class called pair that is storing the two different types of thing. And then inside of our main class, we have a method that returns two different objects. As you know, in Java, you can only return one return value from a method, which is sometimes not super convenient. And so what this pair class lets you do is it lets you return two different things. So we say that this method returns a pair of things, one being a string and one being an integer, and we call it getInfo. Then what this method does is it makes a scanner and asks for your name, and then it gets your age, or rather it asks for your age, and then it returns both of them by putting them into this pair of string and integer object. Then inside of main, we call getInfo and put the result into a pair object, and then we get the first thing and the second thing back out again. Again, kind of a silly example, but just demonstrating the mechanics of how these generics work. So I won't go through compiling and running this, but if we did, it would ask you your name and your age, and then whatever you put in would be printed back out again on this last line. The pair allows us to store whatever two different types of data we want inside of this object. Now C++ actually has this built in as part of the standard library. It has a pair class that works pretty much exactly like this. Java, as far as I can tell, doesn't, but it is handy every now and then. Okay. Now let's turn our attention to doing this with our dynamic list class. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. So there's going to be some slight complications to this because of a problem where Java doesn't work super well when you combine arrays with generic types, but let's go through this. So the first thing we would do as we discussed would be after class dynamic list, we're going to put in type. Then everywhere we see string, basically we're going to replace it with type instead. So we have an array of type objects and we make it an array of type objects in the resize method and in the two constructors. The add method doesn't take just a string, it takes whatever the type is. So it'll be filled in later. Same with the add method down here and the remove method and the search method and also the get method is going to return a type object. So when we're done, we won't have string in here anywhere because it's not hard coded to any particular type of object, type of data. It is gonna store whatever is filled inside of here. All right, so let's go ahead and compile this and see what happens. Now I've already said this is not going to be quite so simple as it should be. And that's because Java has this weird restriction where you can't make a generic array of objects, meaning you can't say you want a new array of something where that thing is a type parameter to be filled in later. Now there's, it's not really a great reason for this. The fact is that Java was designed without any kind of generic support at all. So these generics and type parameters were added after the initial Java programming language was designed quite a bit later actually. And so while they work sort of well, there are some kind of weird edge cases like this where they don't really work with the rest of the type system. So even though we can make 
a new object of a parameterized type like this, we can't make an array of parameterized objects. Again, I think that's kind of a silly restriction, but that's what we have to work around. So every time we did that, it gave us an error like this. Luckily, there is a way to fix this. That is a little bit of a hack, but it's not too terribly bad. So what we're going to do is instead of making a new array of type, we're going to make a new array of object. Now in Java, object is the base class for every other class in the whole language. So every other thing is a type of object, including strings and including dynamic lists and any type of class that you make in your own code. So we can just make it an array of object. And then we also have to go ahead and cast it to an array of type like this. So if I do this here and I do it here, like this, and I do it here as well, it will be fine. So I need to say this is object and I'm going to cast it to type array like this. This I think should fix this problem. Let's go ahead and compile it again. So now it compiles successfully. We did get the dot class file and we can run any code that uses the dynamic list. But if you notice here, now we have another little thing, which is a warning which says that dynamic list.java uses unchecked or unsafe operations. Now, the reason for this is because in general, casting something from an object to a specific type could be dangerous because if you have just any old object, well, we don't necessarily know what type of object it is yet. It could be a array list, it could be a string, it could be a person object, it could be a student object, whatever class you have, it could be any type of thing. And so when you cast it to a specific thing like this, the compiler is saying, hey, whoa, whoa, we don't know for sure. We can't guarantee that it is actually that thing. So in general, this warning makes sense. But in this specific instance, if you think about it, it's not actually going to cause any kind of problem because these objects are all null because they were just literally created. So they're all null, so it doesn't matter what we cast it to. So we can safely ignore this warning. But rather than just live with this warning message and every time we compile just deal with the fact that this thing is here, it's actually better to tell the compiler to ignore this warning on these specific lines. The reason is because Imagine we leave this in here because we know that this specific case of unchecked or unsafe behavior is fine. But then when we're coding and continuing this program, let's say we add a new bit of code that also has a warning. Well, if this is here every time we compile, we're not gonna notice the new potential problem. Every time you get a warning, just in general in coding, you should do your best to figure out if it's a serious problem or not and it's something you need to address. And if it is, you address it. And if it's not, you ignore that specific warning so that when you compile in general, there's no errors, no warnings. That's the best way to go about it. So let's put in the fix for this, which is to do at suppress warnings. And then in quotes, we're going to say unchecked like that, except I think suppress has two Ps. So that will take care of this one. It would be nice if we could just do the same thing for the other lines like this. But the problem is for some reason, the suppress warnings doesn't deal with a line. It deals with a variable declaration. So for this to work, we have to declare these as sort of like fresh parameters. So I'm going to say type dynamic array like this equals such and such. And then we're actually going to store it inside of our instance variable like this. I think this should do it. So it's this is not super pretty, but this is what we have to do. Dynamic array, whatever it is. And just like before, array equals dynamic array. So our code got a little bit messier, but unfortunately it's the way we have to do it to work around this problem. So now what's happening is we're saying, first of all, we're making a new array of plain old objects because that's what Java insists upon. 
Then we're casting it to an array of the thing we actually want, which is type objects, and storing it in this temporary variable. And we're also saying, hey, Java compiler, I know that this thing is unchecked, but take it from me that this is going to be fine and don't issue a warning about this. Suppress that warning. Then we store that inside of the actual instance variable, which is called array. And we do that for the three other ones as well. So let's see if that fixes our problem. And it does. So now this is how it should look when you compile, just in general, no errors, no warnings. You should suppress the individual warnings if you deem that they are not a real problem, which in this case, I'm telling you that's the case. So that is all for our dynamic list, actually. We have it set up now so that you can supply any type you feel like inside of this type of parameter. And the rest of it is written in a generic way. We make a generic array of type objects whenever we create one. When we add, we take a generic type as the thing to add. Likewise, when we remove, we take a generic type. And same thing for getting and searching. It all works in a generic way so that no matter what type of data you're storing inside of this class, it's going to work exactly the same way. The mechanics of keeping track of the data is totally separate from whatever data it actually happens to be. Like I said, we're going to do this with the rest of our data structures as well. So when we get to link lists and trees and hash tables and queues and stacks and all the other things we get to, we're also going to set them up so that it can store any sort of data because that just makes it that much more flexible. So like I said, that was all for the dynamic list. I put a link to the final version here on the website so you can look at the actual code with all of the things that we talked about. So that's all for this module. So hopefully this made sense. And like I said, one of the goals for this was to break down the array list so that you understand really what it's doing underneath the hood. So thanks.